So um, uh, first I would like to uh, thank the organizers and especially uh, Slava for allowing me to, to talk, uh, to sneak in into the, the program. <laughs> um, so, um, so I wasn't actually prepared to give a Blackboard talk because I didn't get any instructions. So I hope it is okay to, to give mostly a uh, talk on the slides. Uh, so, so it's some kind of follow-up of what uh, Philippe uh, told us. Uh, and what I would like to uh, describe here is uh, investigation of a different kind of model that uh, I don't think was included in the list of all the models that have been studied with IPEPS in Philippe's list. Uh, so so it's, uh, it's, it's a Heisenberg antiferroactic model, but which has a very particular feature. It has uh, chirality, that is, it breaks time reversal symmetry. And uh, it is supposed to uh, host uh, new, uh, new type of state, which are topological ordered states. <coughs> and for this reason, it's, I think it's a particularly challenging problem for the IPEPS method to see what's, what's coming out in the, in the investigation of such model. Uh, so, <coughs> what I will do is first uh, give you some motivations uh, why studying this, uh, this model, also from the physical point of view, not only from the, uh, for, for, for testing the ability of, uh, of IPEPS method. Uh, then what I also uh, present is tell you a little bit about the type of PEPS ansatz I will be using. So there are, there are actually uh, important modifications compared to what uh, Philippe described, uh, there will be more constrained PEPs which are designed to address this type of problem. So there will be less variational parameters uh, in, the, in the ANSATS uh, to optimize uh, over them. Uh, and then I will uh, tell you about the modification of the IPEPs method I'm, I'm actually considering, which is somehow simpler, which using the particular symmetry of the, the PEPs uh, ANSATS I'm using. And then I will go to the, uh, to the result, uh, uh, considering this particular model. So the, 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 the actual motivation comes from the, uh, the physics of the fractional quantum Hall effect, uh, I guess. Um, uh, which give actually beautiful example. So, so that deals with, you know, the, the continuum 2D plane. Uh, so there's no lattice in this problem, it's just electrons and the magnetic field and they are interacting with a Coulomb potential, basically. And, uh, and this system uh, hosts uh, uh, topological states which are described by the Laughlin wave function, which is a well-known Laughlin wave function, uh, which has a very simple form. Uh, so this is uh, Psi Laughlin. So it's just a simple um, function of this sort. Okay, so, so zi are just the, the complex coordinate of the particles. Uh, and then there is some exponential factor to confine the particle on a disk. Okay, and m is actually connected to the filling fraction. So, so the filling fraction which is just the number of particle, uh, I guess, divided by the number of fluxes in the system is uh, basically one over n. Okay, so, so for the most well-known uh, fractional portable state, uh, the free fraction is one third, uh, so m is just three. And, and so obviously you, you get a, a fermionic wave function. If you take uh, even values for m, uh, basically you describe bosonic uh, wave function. For example, uh, the simplest bosonic state would correspond to m equal 2, that, correspond, that is filling fraction 1 half. Okay. And so, so this, this is a beautiful, uh, very simple wave function that captures very well the physics of the fractional quantum Hall state. And uh, in the late 80s, Carl uh, Meyer and Laughlin actually wrote uh, the uh, version on, on the, the extension on the lattice. Okay, so this is the Kalmeyer. So I'm not sure I get the spelling right. Is that correct? Kalmeyer? Laughlin. 
And, and the idea is basically to take this uh, bosonic m equal 2 nu equal 1 half wave function and just to put on the lattice. So now the, the coordinates here, z, zi, are now living on the lattice, for example, a square lattice. And, and uh, to, to map the, the wave function, the Laughlin wave function, on a spin one half uh, state, uh, one can do uh, use a simple prescription that basically at the places where there is a particle, you say the particle corresponds to a spin up, and if there is no particle, you know, for example, these places that correspond to a spin down. Okay, and if you do this simple uh, prescription, basically the wave function you get is just a singlet, global singlet uh, wave function which doesn't show any symmetry breaking, no, no longer in order, but it has topological order. And, and, and I will be more precise by what I mean by topological order. And, and so this is the simplest realization and most beautiful representation of what is called a chiral spin liquid. So, so these chiral spin liquid are somehow can be viewed as the, um, the analogs of the fractional quantum all state for, for spin system on the lattice, basically. And so this is what we are targeting. We want to investigate models that uh, are, uh, will have the potential to uh, host uh, such uh, exotic uh, chiral, uh, chiral spin liquid states. So that's basically the motivation. Uh, and so we want to uh, first try to uh, um, consider, I mean, try to investigate, consider some model. I mean, let's see, uh, construct some, let's parent Hamiltonian for this chiral spin liquid, uh, and then try to investigate them with some techniques, which here is going to be the, the IPEF. So, to be clear, this is for odd filling fraction, right? This is. Uh, so, this is for, for m, equal, m equal 2. This is a bosonic, this is a bosonic state. This is a spin, spin, spin one half state. So it's, this is for th this case, m equal to the case. Uh, <coughs> so that corresponds to half filling, actually. There is a commensurability relation. So the number of spin up and the number of empty side is actually equal. So this is why the, you get a global singlet, with, which is invariant under spin rotation. Uh, <coughs> So, so this is what I just said. So, so this Camille Laughlin uh, state is, sorry, now I mix up, uh, is really a paradigmatic example of a chiral spin liquid, a and the goals are the following. So, what we like is uh, to search for some simple projected integral per state, uh, PEPs, uh, ANSATS, that will describe such states. And uh, we want to apply these and uh, optimize those wave function uh, to study simple uh, parent Hamiltonian that will, if, you know, w which have the potential to all such phases. Okay, and and we we might also would like to have such Hamiltonian to be local. And there might be a problem here that we need to uh, construct such such model. Uh, so. <coughs> So if we look for topological uh, spin liquids, uh, really where we have to go is to go beyond the uh, uh, ginzburg landau paradigm, so, so the order parameter paradigm, because those states uh, are characterized by the absence of any spontaneous uh, broken symmetry. Uh, they don't have local uh, order parameters, but they have uh, what uh, was actually introduced by uh, Wen, uh, topological order. So by topological order, I mean, I can maybe take the definition of when uh, is a state whose uh, ground state degeneracy will depend on the topology of space. So if I put, for example, the Camille Laughlin state on a, on a sphere, on a, on a, on a torus, or uh, on another uh, manifold with, more, uh, with higher uh, genus, uh, I, will have, I will get different uh, number of uh, degeneracy of the ground state. So this is will have really a, a ground state uh, a a topological degeneracy here, and and those states will be characterized 
in principle by a gap, so they would be incompressible. And, and then above the gap, uh, the excitation will be fractionalized uh, and ionic excitation. So this is really where we target. Okay. Yes. So this Calmey and Loughlin, that's a wave function. Yes. For a spin system. Yes. And it does not come. Or spin one half. Spin one half system. Yes. It does not come with a Hamiltonian, does it? Uh, so I will go to, to exactly to this question uh, later on. So so there is an Hamiltonian that's been constructed right. by so by your friends uh, that you know, you know, uh, 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 Ignacio and company. And I will, I will describe, I will describe. But that. no, I'm saying the original proposal by Calmeyer and Loughlin did not come with a Hamilton. No, but they were, they were actually suggesting that it will be the ground state of some frustrated spin model. Oh, they okay, I think, the, yeah, the, the, in, the, in the original paper, maybe be the triangle lattice or something like that. But they were suggesting that it could be, uh, and they were suggesting actually that it is equivalent to the RVB wave function of Anderson. So that's actually the, <laughs> the main point of that paper. In their suggested Hamiltonian that would stabilize this wave function, yeah. did they suggest that this would be a gap system? Do you know? Yes, yeah, uh, yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, because I think the wave function, it's known that this wave function should, should, should be li exactly like that, should have a gap. Like the fractional quantum hole state on the on the plane as is is incompressible. So, so yeah, but that's a statement about the Hamiltonian. Ah no no, but if you want to say that this wave function will capture the ground state of the Hamiltonian, it means the the the, the, the Hamiltonian will be will be gapped. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think if if it's local, if if the Hamiltonian is local. And the wave function has finite correlation lengths, then it has to have a gap. Okay, let's say this way. Okay. Yes. But does it does that, is that Hamiltonian going to have anionic excitations that are the same as the anionic excitations of the original fraction? That that's the the, the wheel. I mean, that's what you want. Okay. Yes. Um, okay. So this is one feature you 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 would like to observe, uh, and the other feature. Uh, which is characteristic of these uh, topological state is the fact that they have edge states. Um, so for example, uh, if you put your topological chiral state on a, on a sphere like that and you just imagine you cut the sphere into hemis two hemispheres, then you will observe two counterpropagating uh, edge modes on the two hemispheres. Or if you do the same on a torus, then on each part you cut here, you will also observe counter-propagating uh, edge states. A and these edge states are actually protected by the fact that the, the bulk has long-range entanglement. And they're also uh, described by uh, simple CFTs. So for example, uh, in the case of the uh, Camille Lofton state, what you would uh, uh, observe is the the fact that these edge states are described by simple uh, SU2 level 1 CFT, so just central charge equal to 1. Okay, so now, um, so let's come back to the question of the parent Hamiltonian. So in principle, I have the wave function, and can I construct uh, uh, a parent Hamiltonian that uh, would have this ground state exactly as, you know, uh, th this wave function as the exact ground state? So there have been an attempt to do that uh, in this paper uh, with uh, uh, Ignacio Sirac and Herman Sierra and, and Anne Nielsen. Uh, and what they, they did here, they use uh, actually a, a clever rewriting of the uh, Camille Laughlin state in terms of uh, a conformal field theory correlator that involved the primary fields of the theory. Uh, and, and from this formulation, they were able so don't ask me the details because I don't, I can't really <laughs> answer how they, they do this, but uh, basically with this technique, they are able to derive an exact parent Hamiltonian. Now the problem is that this parent Hamiltonian is very complicated and is long range. So it has a sum of m many three, three body terms at all possible distances. And the, the weight of this term, they decay algebraically with the distance between the sides. Okay, so this is very complicated, but this is exact, I believe. Now, what they do in this paper, they uh, say that they can truncate 
Okay, so they truncate and they just keep the, the short distance term. Okay, so if you look at the short distance term, which they claim is uh, the most relevant, there will be just a simple nearest neighbor Heisenberg coupling. So these are just spin one, this is, this is spin one Hamiltonian, spin one half Hamiltonian. And then it will have some, some frustrating term. So the J2 is an antiferromagnetic coupling, but now between next nearest neighbor site, so along the diagonal. So I have a square lattice. So J1 is, is a term like, like that, and the J2 is a term like that. And now what is important is that J1 is positive and J2 is also positive. So these two terms are actually frustrating. <coughs> so, so this J2 actually will eventually, uh, um, we will eventually kill the nail state. Uh, it for, for li large enough amplitude. And, and now they have a term which is uh, very important, which is the term that actually breaks time reversal symmetry, and which is this term. So this term is defined on a plaquette, and it's basically what, what, what this operator do, so this plaquette is IJKL, and what the operator do, PIJKL, is just make a cyclic permutation of, of, the, of the spin on the four sides. So it makes a cyclic permutation, and then this guy is the inverse permutation, and then this term is intri intrinsically complex. So it, it does break time reversal symmetry. Okay, so, uh, and you can even write this term, maybe it will be clearer, uh, you can write this uh, Carroll term as also, if you have a plaquette, site one, two, three, four, th th you can rewrite it as the sum of, uh, um, scalar chirality, so, uh, so you can write it as S1 dot S2 cross S3 <coughs> plus uh, the other triangle like that, S1 dot S2, um, no, so this one, no, this one, S1 dot S2 cross S4, etc. plus the two other one, okay. So this is, this is just, uh, the, uh, <coughs> so, so when you write that, you have to pay attention to which order, to which direction you, you, you write the triple product between the spin. So this is the simplest Carroll term you can think of on, this, on the square lattice. <coughs> and so now what they do is they try to map the phase diagram for this Hamiltonian. And the calculation they do, although quite interesting, is maybe not completely reliable in the sense that what they do is they do exact linearization. So sorry, Andreas, but on also pretty small size, much smaller than yours. And, um, and the, what they try is to maximize the overlap with the chimeral Laughlin state. Okay, so they get the ground state, they look at the overlap, and then they tune the parameters and to, uh, to get the maximum overlap. And they say that there is a region here where the overlap is very close to one. So they would say that in the thermodynamic limit, in this region of parameter space, so this is two parameters, J2 over J1, and this coupling lambda C divided by J1, and there is a region here uh, where the, the uh, Carroll spin liquid will be, will be uh, phase will be stable. <coughs> okay, but this is based on this small uh, cluster calculation. So now what we want to do is try to attack this problem. So consider this simplified truncated model and now see what we get with using IPEPS, uh, IPEPS method. <coughs> yes? So in the original untruncated Hamiltonian, yes. J1, J2 and lambda C were fixed? <coughs> Yes, yes. And so what, what they do is they <coughs> truncate and then they say, let's yeah, compensate yeah. for that with... Exactly, they not only truncate, but they also re uh, allow for, for changing the, the parameters they keep. Okay. Yes, okay. yes. Otherwise it would be too brutal. I don't know where, where you will be, but there would be one point here which correspond to the truncated model. Mm -hmm. But it might be out of, the, out of this blue region. I, I don't remember. So, so the two points here is the one they, they study more closely and which I will also look at where they have a lot of data. And, and this is supposed to have, you know, the, 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 to get the best overlap with the Kalmyra-Laughlin state on, on, small, on small cluster. 
So this is the one I will, the parameter I will consider these, these two points. So this one has J1, J2, and lambda C. Okay, now um, the, the issue is actually if I want to use PEPs uh, to address this question uh, is re really whether there is, uh, um, ca can we actually do that? Can we actually describe a chiral spin liquid with, with PEPs? And there have been a number of arguments in the literature. Uh, the first thing comes from a, a no-go theorem by uh, Dubai and, and Reed that, uh, but that concern actually a uh, tensor network that describes free fermions. So this is tensor network that are ground state of free fermion Hamiltonian. And what they say is that, I think this is exact, they say that this chiral tensor network for free fermion uh, have no gap local parent Hamiltonian, which means that if you take such of these, uh, such the, these tensor network, uh, basically if you try to build uh, a parent Hamiltonian, and there are, you know, the parent Hamiltonian is not unique, that you can build an uh, arbitrary number, uh, they will have two properties that could be, if you insist that there will be local, then there will be gapless. Okay, now if you insist that they uh, they are gapped, then uh, the hopping amplitude will decay according to a power law. So you cannot have both. You cannot have a, a parent Hamiltonian that will be <coughs> together local and have a, a, a gap spectrum. Okay. Uh, now, whether this applies to uh, the ground state of uh, uh, interacting spins uh, model is, is not clear. And, and th there have been one example in the literature uh, for, uh, of a particular PEPs of this kind, um, uh, which, which they, they construct from, from two layers of uh, free fermion PEPs uh, by using some gas velocity projection on the site. So it's really an interacting version. Uh, but it's true that in this case, they get diverging correlation lengths. So for the moment, there's no example of a Carroll of a PEPS, a Carl PEPS, that will have a uh, finite correlation length. So, so, so but are you going to define Carl PEPS? What is the definition? Yes, I will, def I will define it. Yes, sorry, maybe. <laughs> yes. So what, what's the meaning of not fully in red in there? Uh, maybe I should have uh, removed it, yes. Okay. Yeah, but it, not fully in the sense that I can define some, but still I have to... to but it's a counterexample to what? I mean. There is a no goal theorem. Yeah, yeah, it will, it will, it will go, it will be, yeah, it will go with a no goal. It will agree with a no goal theorem. Yeah, you, you, so, you're right. So. Yeah. So next time I will remove that. Okay. Good. I'll check. <laughs> Thank you. No goal theorem of Jerome and Nick. Yes. I mean, looking for the a chiral in free for a free fermion. It yes. Seems kind of the wrong place to look. Because free fermions are going to be trivial, aren't they? Uh, well, this is a class of, of PEPs, which are called these Gaussian PEPs, and, and uh, I, I guess this is the reason why they managed to get exact theorem in this case, because it's very simple, but uh, I mean, uh, I'm sure they're trying to find a more general theorem. They, they, they have been trying no, for, for several years, but I haven't seen anything that, but they, I don't think they, they, they have a free fermionic theories on a lattice. I mean, I could imagine adding <coughs> complex hoppings that would break the yeah, reverse flow. Yes, yes. So they're saying that that won't yeah, ever. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay. So now, what I what do I mean by by Carol Peps? Just to be let me more, be more precise. So so what I want is I want a state that actually uh, breaks time reversal symmetry in the following way. So so assume I take my my square lattice. And now I look at the point group, okay? So I just specify a given site here, and, and the point group is characterized, for example, by some reflection symmetry. So uh, Rx along the x-axis, Ry, and the diagonal, the reflection uh, uh, with respect to the diagonal uh, direction. Then what I, what I want is that for all these symmetry uh, of the C4V group, discrete C4V group, I want that when I apply this symmetry on the state, uh, I get the time reverse partner. Okay, so this is my definition of a Carroll Peps. Okay, so so if I do any reflection, 
with respect to any axis, then I will get the complex conjugate. Okay, so this is my definition. So basically, if I do a reflection, I will just change the, the circulation of the edge modes, for example. So I will just get the complex conjugate. It's like changing the magnetic field, if you want. So, so, so this, is my, this is my definition. Uh, <coughs> and um, so this is my the, the, the condition I want to realize. And now I have a simple prescription, which might not be necessary, but at least it works. Okay, so it might not be the most general way of constructing Carroll peps, but at least it's a prescription that gives the result I, I would like. Uh, so the, the, the idea is basically to, to realize that I can construct a wave function which has a sum of two terms, so a real part and, and a, an imaginary part here. And these two terms will transform differently with respect to the point group symmetry of my lattice. Okay, so for example, this one will transform according to the A1 irrep of C4V, so it's completely symmetric. It's like an S wave, if you want, state. And the other part here will transform according to the A2 symmetry. Okay, so it means uh, A2 symmetry is like, a, uh, I think, a G orbital in, 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 in uh, atomic physics. That is, if I do a reflection with respect to any, any of these axes here, I get a minus sign. Okay, so it's like a, an orbital which has many, many zeros, which are eight zeros, you know, like, okay. So, so it's basically belong to the A2 irrep of the C4V group, okay. And now the nice thing about, uh, about PEPs is that this is a symmetry of the global wave function. But now I can enforce this symmetry locally at the level of the PEPs. This is what I find it beautiful because you need only to enforce it at the level of the PEPs, of the unique PEPs tensor. So I will construct a, a PEPs tensor with the same tensor on every side, and I will enforce this symmetry just at the level of each PEP tensor. Um, so, so how do we do that? To do that, we need to make a classification based on, on the symmetries of the problem. So, so the two symmetries we, we want to, uh, to include are the SU2 symmetry, uh, because we're looking for a SU2 symmetric uh, singlet state, and uh, also the lattice symmetry, because I want to separate between A1 and A2 tensors. Okay. And so what we do is, is, a possible, is, is possibly to classify all the PEPs according to these two symmetries. So what basically what we do is, so, so this is your tensor here, this is a physical space S, and this is the, the virtual spaces here. So the virtual spaces we can uh, basically enumerate all possible uh, virtual space in terms of direct sum of E rep of SU2. Okay, so this would be spin one half plus zero, and then this one spin one half plus zero plus zero, one half plus one half plus zero, and that would correspond to different uh, dimension, bond dimension, D, three, four, five, and so on. So we can make a full list of all possibilities on the virtual, on the virtual level. And for each of them, for let's say if we say now the virtual spin is, uh, uh, the, the physical spin is one half, then we can actually look at how many different ways can we actually project this virtual space that belong to these uh, different spaces to the spin one half, okay? And, and we can just count them. Uh, so it's, uh, it can be done easily, I mean, efficiently with Mathematica, for example. And, and then you count the number of tensors you, you can generate. And actually, surprisingly, the number of tensors is uh, not very large. It's much smaller than the total number of tensor elements. You know, the total number of tensor elements would be, uh, would be just uh, d, uh, what is it, d to the four times small d, okay, the physical dimension, which is two here. So, so the number of, of tensor I can uh, realize is much smaller than that, you know, so this is, for the A1 symmetry, I have actually two tensors, eight, 10, 21, and, and for A2, one, four, eight, 12. So total number of, of parameters I will have is, is this. Because how does it work? Now what I do is I implement the constraint I want, the symmetry I want, at, at the level of the tensor. So I write the tensor now is a real part plus some imagery part. And this real part now is a linear combination of all the tensors 
of this A1 symmetry. For example, for this case, I will have 10 tensors here. So I will have 10 parameters in front here to optimize. And uh, for A2, I will have eight parameters here to optimize. Okay, so it's a very small number of parameters. And so that, that means that now I can do uh, a different type of optimization than the one described by, by Philippe, which is the uh, time evolution, imagery time evolution, I can actually do uh, brute force uh, minimization. Okay, just minimizing over a small number of parameters. That, that's, that's possible. Um, so, so, so what I am going to do... Yes. So, so are you, you start with the Hamiltonian, which is the truncated Hamiltonian. Yes. Okay. And that Hamiltonian has <coughs> some symmetries. Yes. Space symmetries. And so this you're, ones. This one. So yeah. you are not making any assumption here. You are actually just... Yeah. I'm using the symmetry of the Hamiltonian. So you ex ex right. But, but I, I assume, I assume the, the, the ground state doesn't break those symmetries okay. spontaneously. Continuously. Yeah. But yeah. you're also fixing the bond dimensions, the SU2 representations on the bond index. Right. And right. this is your restriction. Right? Yeah, but, but you know, I, I, if I go further and further in, in, in D, if I crank up D, then I will have to look at separately all the possibility for the, for the, the virtual space. So, so let's say, for you see here, for example, for five, I, I can take this virtual space or I can take this virtual space. They will correspond to two different solutions. They don't mix. Don't want to mix them. And then I will look at the energy which is the lowest. I was trying to understand in which sense you are making a, a, an answer, right? What, what is the answer? Oh, the answer is saying that uh, by, by doing this prescription here, uh, you know, taking, first taking uh, the same tensor on every side, yeah. and by writing the tensor as in this form, I have the most general tensor that gives rise to a translationally invariant state which have the chirality, uh, the chiral property I want. But, but there might be, you know... But this is not answers, right? I mean, you, you, assume, no, no. you, you assume translational invariance that's making yes. answers. Yeah. No, but you know, it's not clear that the, the, the family of all these uh, uh, states uh, span the whole space of, of tensors which are translationally invariant. You, you might have tensors which are defined with two sides, for example, with two different tensors, and which would be still translation invariant. But you, that you would not be able to, to rewrite with a single tensor on the side. I mean, this, I, I, that's a complicated problem. But I mean, you, you agree that, no? I mean, so. But it's reasonable that it will capture uh, but most the of this. The yeah, 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 yeah. I agree. Okay. I agree. Yes. I agree. Okay, so now how are we going to, to do? So, so we have these, these uh, PEPs that depend on a small number of parameters. And, and the method I will, go, I will use is basically uh, very much the same as, as described by, by Philippe. So this is the infinite uh, projected integral per state method. So I will use... Uh, the environment, so, so basically the, the idea is, you know, I have a plaquette here of four sides where my Hamiltonian acts. So I really have to consider four sides. Uh, and then I have the uh, tensor on the top, the psi, the, the bra and the ket. Okay? And I want to investigate the, the, the expectation value of this operator, of the Hamiltonian operator, which I have in, the, in, in, in yellow. Now, what, of course, what I have is, is all the tensors on the up to infinity on the on the around this this plaquette? Okay. So what I want to do is I want to use an approximate contraction of all the tensors from infinity up to uh, the the up to some environment here. Okay. So I want this environment here tensors to capture all the contraction of the tensors from infinity. And uh, as uh, Philippe explained nicely, this is done with a renormalization, uh, real space renormalization scheme based on this corner transfer matrix. So this corner transfer matrix is the, the, this matrix here on the, on the corner and then also the environment involves this T tensor here that, that build the, the edge of this, of this box here. Um, and, and so once I have the energy for a given set of tensor, 
what I do is just brute force optimization. So I can compute the gradient by varying a little bit each of these parameters. So I, I compute the multidimensional gradient and I do the uh, 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 full optimization with conjugate gradient method. And this is feasible because just I have reduced enormously the, the complexity of the problem to a small number of parameters. So it's, it's, it's feasible by using all the symmetries I can. Now, there, there are, uh, compared to what Philippe described, there are a simple simplification uh, that uh, can be used. Uh, uh, the fact that uh, first the corner transfer matrix here that I have on every corner would, would be exactly the same because those tensor by construction are taken exactly the same. So this corner transfer matrix would be the same. I have only one corner transfer matrix and all these T also would be the same. So I need only to do a renormalization of just one corner uh, and then I can just copy and paste uh, the, the, the other matrices on, on, the, on the environment. Uh, the other thing which makes uh, some simplification is that this corner transfer matrix now is a mission. <coughs> it's a mission, so instead of doing SVD, I can do more stable uh, exaggerization uh, to get the, to truncate. And, and actually that was suggested by Philippe to me at some point, a yeah. long time ago. Um, and it actually works uh, well. <coughs> Uh, and also the last thing uh, which is being done in this renormalization process is that uh, the SU2 symmetry is preserved uh, at each step uh, because uh, at the truncation step one avoid to cut within a, a SU2 multiplet. So you have really to look at where are the SU2 multiplet and just keep the full SU2 multiplet when you make a truncation. But apart from these uh, simplification, and I think make the method more efficient, the algorithm is very similar to uh, what Philippe explained, that basically what you do is uh, you have the corner here, you just add one site, and then uh, by, by doing this exaggerization, you do a truncation and you introduce some isometry here, and then uh, this isometry you absorb in the T-tensor to get the new T-tensor, okay? So this is a standard. CTMRG uh, real space renormalization. Okay, um, so maybe I should, uh, unless there is some question about the method, I will go to, to some result. Let's okay, uh, okay. So so what what I, I I now I do is I go to the uh, to the previous truncated Hamiltonian I described, and uh, here I will. Uh, focus on this point in the parameter space, you know, so for this particular value of the coupling, which in the original paper uh, was claimed to be a point where the, the overlap with the Camille Laughlin state is maximum. So it's potentially the, 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 the point, the parameters which are best to, uh, to obtain such a state. And so what I draw here is the energy as a function of what? As a function of d squared divided by chi. So chi is the environment dimension. So I think I use the same notation as Philippe. So this is the dimension that enters here in blue so of the environment here. And, and this uh, dimension you should scale, as Philippe said, you should scale it like d squared. So the relevant parameter is really d squared uh, divided by chi. And, and what you want, of course, is go to the limit where chi uh, is going to infinity. So you want to go here. Do you want to extrapolate uh, here on this, on this axis? Um, and so here I show two examples for two different choice of the virtual space. So I think this one is for one half plus zero. So it's very small bond dimensions, d equals three. And this one is, uh, d equals four, this is one half plus zero plus zero, and this one is one half plus one half plus zero, which will give this point here, but I've been unable to, to get further points in this because of instability problem. But you, what you see already for this small bond dimension that if I just increase chi, then I, try, I, I have to extrapolate like linearly with one over chi, so this is very important to do the extrapolation, and I can get quite accurate estimation of the variational energies for these two cases. 
And uh, what is interesting you now, if I compare to the uh, Kalmea Laughlin energy in the thermodynamic limit, uh, so it's reasonable to compare. I mean, both calculations are in the thermodynamic limit, and, and this Kamel Laughlin energy you can get very accurately in, in, in Monte Carlo. And what you get, see is that the energy, even for the small d parameters, I get energy which is below the Kamel Laughlin en uh, energy, which is the targeted state. I mean, this is why this simultaneous was constructed. Okay, so I get something better. Uh, so, which means that the you know, th that suggests that the, the PEPS uh, is a reliable description of the ground state of this, uh, of, of this state. So now what I want to see is whether this state has one important feature of the Carroll spin liquid, which is the existence of, uh, of uh, Carroll edge modes. Okay, so this is the first thing to, to check. And this Monte Carlo is done on the same Hamiltonian. Exactly. No, no, there is no Hamiltonian. It's for the Camille Laughlin. It's just, oh, just it's just Varsh, it's just uh, Monte Carlo for the Camille Laughlin state. Okay. There's no Hamiltonian. It's just the energy. Ah, oh, no, but this is the energy in this Hamiltonian for the Camille Laughlin state. And then the exact diagonalization. Oh, okay. So this I didn't talk about that because I thought it would be the exonalization is is much lower, but for the reason that usually uh, you have in small clusters you have very strong. Uh, quantum fluctuation that lower the energy very much. So if you would be able to do finite size scaling, uh, what you would see that actually uh, the energy for 30 side, for when you increase the number of side, it would just go up uh, dramatically. So, so this is difficult to compare to, to this value. Uh, so if you don't have finite size scaling, uh, I don't think when it means anything. It's a gap state, so the finite size corrections. Well, how do you know it's a, how do you know it's a gap state? That's the point. It's it's uh, it's an Hamiltonian that, that was constructed in order to indeed get a, get a gapped uh, phase, but uh, at the end of the day, you don't know what you get after the truncation. So so, well that that's I think that's an interesting problem for you to try to crank up the. Maybe we can get reasonable energy. I mean, they, they I think this is the limit they've gone. Maybe thirty sides. And uh, I don't think it's very good because it's five times six, so it has an odd number of sides in one direction, which I think is not too good when you have, you know, it, it frustrates somehow the, the antiferromagnetic order. So it's, it's not a very good uh, cluster shape. Um, okay, so, so let's, let me come to the, to the issue of the, uh, of the, um, of the edge states. So now there, there is a conjecture which has been uh, put forward by uh, Lee and Aldane um, in a, a famous paper. It's a recent paper. Uh, that actually the entanglement spectrum will capture all the physics of the, of the edge modes. So if you, for example, if you take a cylinder like that and you calculate, you, you make a partition into A and B, so it's a mathematical partition, uh, and then you calculate the reduced uh, density matrix by tracing over the, you know, like the B, the, the degrees of freedom of the half cylinder of this projector, psi psi, and then you write uh, row A as you can write rho a as the exponential of minus some Hamiltonian with some normalization. Then the spectrum of, of, this, of this guy is in one-to-one -one correspondence with the, the actual edge states. And it has been checked for fractional quantum whole state and it works extremely well. So, so then the idea is uh, to compute the entanglement spectrum so the entanglement spectrum is the spectrum of this guy, of this Hamiltonian. So it's the spectrum of minus the log of the reduced density matrix. 
and and from this we should uh, we should have uh, the the basically we should get something which is in one to one correspondence with the the actual edge states <coughs> of the system. Is it just a general observation, or it's I think it's a conjecture. I don't think it has been. Or this is true for these specific systems. Oh, they have they have shown that for the I think for the new equivalent uh, uh, Laughlin state. Uh, and then it has been used in many other cases for, for non-Abelian uh, uh, fractional quantum whole state. And I, I think these examples always have in common that these are chiral phases yes, with yes. a gap. Yes, 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 exactly. And maybe that's relevant here, if you don't know <laughs> if you have a gap. You, you, will, you, will, you will see, because, uh, yeah, exactly. So now the, 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 there is a puzzle still I'm, I'm, I'm coming to. Um, Will you explain how this correspondence work, this one-to-one -one correspondence? Okay, so the, this one-to-one -one correspondence is, well, maybe I can show uh, you here, okay? So, so what I draw here now with this entanglement spectrum as a function of the uh, momentum uh, uh, along the, uh, the circumference of my, of my cylinder. Uh, and for PEP, there is a very simple way of computing this guy. So I will not go into the detail, but there is some bulk edge correspondence uh, that we have established that allow to a very efficient calculation of the entanglement spectrum for an infinite cylinder. So what you keep finite is the circumference, but you can let the cylinder become infinite. And, and, and then you can get, the, so the spectrum of the, this, and what you get as a function of the, the momentum uh, along the circumference is something very, uh, uh, very particular. What you find is really uh, linear dispersion. So, so you really find chiral modes. You don't find the CFT spectrum uh, uh, that uh, Giffre was showing, you know, where you have really have two branches and everything is filled inside. Here you just have one branch. So it's really chiral. You just have one branch going in one direction with one velocity. And, and the correspondence is the following, is that now if you do the, the precise counting uh, here, that, that what you get is basically the, the counting that you would expect for, for the, the, the CFT uh, that characterizing the, the edge states. Okay, so maybe, the, may, maybe the, the, the energy levels would not be exactly at the right position, uh, but, but the counting would be correct. And by counting, I mean now if you look at the quantum numbers of all these states for a given k, for example here, 2, 1 plus 0 means I have two triplets here, which are these symbols, plus one singlet. And then if I go up, you know, I go here, then I have all these states. I have a quintuplet plus, plus two triplet plus two singlets and so on. And now if I look at what I should get from the CFT, so if, you, if you're like me, you don't know much about CFT, so you take the yellow book and you look uh, uh, at what you should get. Uh, so this is for the SU2 level one CFT. And you look at the table in, this, in the book, and, and uh, what they provide is the SU2 decomposition. So all the quantum numbers for the tower of state that you get. And so here, they, they actually, they use different notations. So two means actually spin one. And one means spin one half. I don't know why they, they do that, OK? So, so, and, and so you have all these countings you know, for the different uh, levels of the tower of state. And you can check that actually. The, the counting is uh, exactly what, what, what you get here. Okay, so this is exactly the right uh, counting here. Uh, one triplet, one triplet singlet, and so on. And, and of course here there, there are some dispersion because the size, when you go further in momentum, this, you know, 10 minutes, okay, thank you. Uh, and what, what, what yeah. is, sorry, what is meant by the even and odd sector in your case? Yeah, so, so this is something I forgot to say, but there is a gauge symmetry uh, of the tensors that allow me to uh, construct two different sectors. Uh, oops. Uh, uh, uh. Yeah, by, uh, you know, so, so if I, I can play with the boundary. So, so the, the way to compute this is just to iterate the transfer matrix from, from you know, basically from infinity. And so I can fix these topological sectors using this Z2 symmetry at the uh, in the initial state, and and then it would be preserved, and so I can just diagonalize this uh, reduced density matrix in these two different sectors. Another question. Yes. Why is the momentum modulus pi and not two pi? Uh, ah, you notice that. Okay. Um, 
Is it because you can put? Yes. In f in f okay. I, I tell you. Okay. It's, there's the technicalities because in fact, uh, in order to to in order uh, to have only one tensor per site, what I do is I do a spin rotation on the B site. Otherwise, I would have to use two different tensors, and so that breaks that somehow breaks the uh, translation symmetry. So there is some translation symmetry breaking here, and it means the spin multiplets will appear at momentum k and k plus pi. You know, so, so I could use uh, momentum modulus 2 pi, but then I will have the multiplet coming at two different momentum. So what I do is I just write everything in terms of modulus pi, and so just to bring back all the different terms of the multiplets together. But it's not the property of the boundary theory. It's some no, no, no. Uh, yes. So, so, so you see here, I have pretty good uh, evidence that actually the edge, you know, the, these these uh, states have have well-defined uh, Carroll edge modes, which are described by this uh, SU two level one uh, theory. Uh, now the the, the uh, surprise comes from the uh, from the investigation of the correlation function. So uh, and as you say, I would expect you know that my state would be would be gapped. You know I have nice uh, edge states, and so I would expect the bulk is is gapped. And actually, this is not the case. So for example, you can calculate two types of correlation function. And uh, neither of them actually turn out to be, to be uh, short range. So the first uh, correlation function you can compute is basically the dimer uh, dimer correlation. So what you do, you know, the now, now that you have the, your, your environment tensors, what you can do, you can construct a strip here. Okay? So, and, and, co and, and here look at the correlation between S dot S on these, on these bonds with S dot S on these bonds. So it's like a four point correlation function as a function of the distance between the two, the two objects. And, uh, and basically, uh, this environment here is, takes into account the, the rest of the system. You, know, you have to think that basically you have, you have contracted all tensors from infinity to, to there. And, and the effects of the environment is taken care by, 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 by these red uh, tensors here. And so in principle, you can calculate correlation to arbitrary, basically arbitrary distance. Uh, and so this is what I show in a semi-log plot. So this is the log of the correlation as a function of distance. And what you see is uh, something that you would expect that for large distance, because for finite chi of the environment, it will all be a straight line, which means that there is an exponential decay at very long distance. But now what, is, uh, what, what appears is that if you now compute these correlation lengths from the slope here, and you draw the correlation lengths uh, as a function of chi, of the, the environment dimension, you see that actually it seems to scale linearly uh, with, with chi. Okay, so that suggests that actually it, it, it doesn't saturate for the value of chi I've, I've considered. It will, it, it will never saturate. And these are, these are pretty large value of chi, you know, uh, going up to 20 times d square. So it's, it's, not, it's not small. And it seems to linearly, uh, to vary linearly, which means that, you know, the, co the correlation length diverge and, and that's consistent with the power law decay of the dimer dimer correlation. And actually, if you look at short distance, you know, below this, uh, this exponential behavior, you can actually pretty much fit the data with a power law. Uh, now you can also look at uh, five minutes. Yes, I will be almost done. Uh, so this is uh, <coughs> the last plot I want to, to show. So now you can also compute the spin-spin correlation. So, so the first correlation was basically the, the correlation in the singlet sector, and this is now the correlation in the triplet sector, if you want. Uh, and you do the same, uh, you play the same game, so you construct this strip here, and you put the environment on the side, and then here now you have a spin operator, and a spin operator, and you look at the correlation between these two, two sides as a function of d. And again, you can do the plot the data on a semi-log uh, plot, the log of the spin-spin correlation versus the distance d here. 
between the, the sites. And uh, what you find is, is, the first thing you find is that a short distance, you find a very, uh, a very short correlation length, a decay, a very sharp decay with a very short correlation length. And actually, this correlation length is compatible with the calmere law instant. It's basically the, what they get in, in Monte Carlo. So it means that a short distance, the wave function, the ground state we get, I mean, the, the, the ansatz we get, is, is as the same property, as the same spin-spin correlation, a short distance, maybe up to distance, I don't know, 10 or something like that. It's very similar. So, so at short distance, I think we cannot distinguish our <coughs> ansatz from the Kamir Laughlin state, which, which uh, but now at long distance, it, it's, more, it's more tricky because now we get again this exponential decay. Uh, but now, uh, again, the, the length scale we, um, we extract doesn't seem to, to saturate with, with chi. So it's again chi up to 16 times d square, and, and we no, don't see any sign of saturation. Uh, but now the difference with the Daimler-Daimler correlation is that if I look at the weight here corresponding to this exponential decay, it's very, very small. So actually, if I, uh, if I write my correlation function in terms of a sum of exponential, which is basically what I can get from this plot, then, then the weight here associated to the, the largest correlation length is becoming very small. So in this decomposition, uh, I will have a very exponentially small weight. So, so all distances will be, if I do this expansion, all distances will be will be included, psi max will go to basically infinity with chi going to infinity, but the weight will be becoming very small. So I think the, the decay, I don't know the analytic form, but I think the decay will be actually, uh, uh, it will be slower than, of course, a pure exponential, but it will be faster than, than algebraic, uh, uh, algebraic uh, decay. So this is something in between, maybe a stretch, stretch exponential or something complicated like that, but it's, it's clearly not simple to, to uh, okay. So, so now this is uh, the big issue that uh, uh, is, is left, is whether these features, first, are there ge really generic features of the ground set of this model? And, uh, or are there artifact of the, of the PEPS uh, <coughs> representation? Uh, and also, if, if there are really generic features of this model, are they really generic features of all spin liquids uh, of this type. So th this is uh, basically the, the conclusion of this study. And so I would like to summarize and then uh, propose some uh, outlook. Uh, so to summarize, I would say that this, this method uh, offers a really a new conceptual understanding and a quantitative description of many uh, quantum antiferromagnet with exotic ground states. Uh, so not only the one that were described by, by Philippe, which show uh, you know, spontaneous symmetry breaking, like stripe order or, or you know, all this sort of order, but also topological state, uh, which has a more, maybe a more involved type of ordering. Um, that uh, also what is important is that they, you know, the, the virtual degrees of freedom, in fact, play really a physical role at the boundary because the physical, the, the Virtual degrees of freedom really are the one that actually build uh, the the edge the edge states. So so the 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 edge Hamiltonian is really an Hamiltonian that acts on the virtual degrees of freedom at, at the edge of your system. So they acquire some physical physical meaning in a way. Now what uh, what can be done if I have thirty more seconds uh, is uh, extend this to to many many other cases. So one obvious uh, extension is to look at Hamilton with larger spin, like for example spin one, where we might, uh, uh, um, host, where, where we might uh, realize some chiral spin liquid, which would be, would have, you know, would be some non-abelian uh, chiral spin liquid with more complicated edge states, maybe SU2 level two type uh, edge states. Uh, and we know that in the, the field of fractional quantum hole effect, there, there are such you know, uh, more involved uh, topological states. So, so the, the aim is to try to, to, to construct this in the, in the field of, of quantum magnetism. Uh, of course, we can use uh, other lattices. Uh, we can look at other symmetries, like uh, Philippe mentioned. 
and, and, and I, I don't think so far there's been uh, any discovery of SU3 or SU4 chiral liquid so far. No, there is? Okay, so I have, you have to tell me. Um, and, and maybe uh, it could be applied to, to, uh, to discretize uh, field theory, but this is really not my, my field, so I will not go f uh, elaborate more. So, and then finally, I would like to thank my collaborators over the, uh, the past years. Actually, uh, especially uh, uh, Ignacio Sirac, Norbert Schur, uh, and, uh, and uh, Roman Horus, from whom I learned a lot of these techniques in the last, uh, say, seven or eight years. Um, also, I'd like to thank my collaborator, Mathieu Mambrini in Toulouse, for uh, the, his major role in the classification of SU2 uh, PEPs. And uh, also, uh, Jan Affleck, who collaborated at some point on the carol spin liquid um, issue. Okay, and I'd like to thank you for your attention. Questions? Yes. So if we take a point of view that this, for some reason, is gapless, yes. then do you think uh, there's a chance to have emergent Lorentz invariants? Yeah, I, I thought there would be some emergent uh, gauge symmetry that will, you know, like U1 gauge symmetry at some point, I will, uh, because we, we know that there are simple PEPs which have U1 gauge symmetry and which are, and we know why they are gapless. So maybe there is some emergent gauge symmetry that appearing, but. Well, I was wondering what is the, the dynamical critical exponent in this? Could it be one? Yeah, I, I don't know. How do you compute that? I mean, I. Uh, you would have to look at the spectrum of the excited states right. from the very hard and final point. Yeah, exactly. I, I mean, uh, constructing excited state for this Carol Hamiltonian, I'm not sure it's... Well, it could be attempted, but I don't have any any idea of... I mean, maybe with the method you, you suggested, you know, with some V tensors and you... But, but that's I super hard. I didn't understand what the conclusion is for the ground state. What's the conclusion for the ground state? The conclusion is that I have, you know, I have a state, I have constructed a state for this Hamiltonian, which has a better energy than the uh, Camille Laughlin state. So which point to the fact that it is a good uh, representation of the ground state. Okay. Uh, and which has both features. The first feature, it has well-defined Carroll edge modes, which are described <coughs> by this SU2 level 1 CFT. I think this is very, very good evidence. So, so, but I'm and a little confused about that. It's and this that you extracted those edge modes from this entanglement formula. Yes, right? yes. Which is I still valid, even though... That's why I'm confused. What, what, is, what is it that goes into this... Okay, the conjecture. Oh, you want to me? Do you you mean whether I can use a conjecture in right. this case? Yes. The the answer is I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I don't. I have to ask uh, Duncan whether I think it's it's still valid, but uh, I don't know. But it's a conjecture. It's a conjecture. Yeah. So it has it has been. <laughs> uh, yes. No, but I mean. But no, no. You might have a feeling. You know, you might have a you feeling know whether there are edge modes for certain. Yeah. You would want to know that. Is yeah. that what does it mean edge mode? This is dynamics, right? And we haven't established whether this is a gap Hamiltonian or a gapless Hamiltonian. Right. That may have an important impact on the dynamics. Right. But, you, you but what's clear is that when you compute this, this entanglement spectrum, it has a structure that is compatible with a kind of CF2. Yeah. Okay. So I should rephrase, maybe don't say edge modes, but entanglement spectrum, which are well described by uh, this SU2 level 1 CF2. And the question right. is what to make with yeah. that. Okay. Yes. And at the same time, so this is one feature, and the second feature is that it seems, I seem to have good evidence that the correlation functions are, are long range, <coughs> both in the spin and in the triplet set. Which would indicate that this is a gapless Hamiltonian? Yeah, exactly. exactly. Exactly, because Hamiltonian is local, no? So, so I think you can immediately would say, if this is really a good representation of the ground state, then the Hamiltonian should be, should be gapless. Yes, yeah, sorry, uh, Andreas. Sorry, I, I missed it. It's, it's my, my fault. But your, your, the state to construct, do you do that for fixed d, like d equals 3? Or what is the bond dimension of your of yes. states? Or do you have a family of... Things? Yes, yes, exactly. I have, I have several families. So here I only showed... Uh, uh, 
So, so each of these curves correspond to a different family, which is optimized. You see, so, so for example, the blue, the blue curve corresponds to this d equals 4 case, 1 half plus 0 plus 0, for, for the largest chi I could, I could handle, which is 256. Uh, and and the, the green one corresponds to this very simple 1 half plus 0 ansatz. And, for, and, and there are two sets of curves that correspond to, to chi 36 and 144. So, so this one is, this one is for, for 36 and this one is for uh, 144. And, and you see the decay is, 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 here the decay is less severe, so the correlation length is bigger. So they correspond to two different points in this, in this plot. I'm just wondering a bit, I mean, I, I'm personally thinking that, that this Hamiltonian, if it's truncated, it's very likely that it's a gapped Hamiltonian, and it, it's in the same, the ground state is a, is a chiral spin liquid, but the genuine one without the gap. <coughs> and then if you take these PEPs, theorems, no-go theorems for granted, you can still ask, okay, it might be that they're not at finite bond dimension, they're not able to exactly reproduce a chiral spin liquid, but how, how well do they approximate that? And since you, you, you said yourself that initially at short distances it seems like reproducing... Yeah, the yeah, thi this, yeah this, I be this I believe. I, this I believe at short distance uh, I am okay, basically. But I get the right I mean, shot. It's hard, it's not in the picture, but it could it be that as you crank up D and you do a a heavier job that actually these tails are, are somehow the compromise between the fact yeah. that at finite bond yeah. dimension you're not able to get yeah. um, everything correct. So this is the, the, the approximation yeah. tail, yeah. but actually the further you go in D, the more you're you right. You're right. There, there are two options. I mean, one option is I get the correct physics, and the, uh, this Hamiltonian does have this type of, of ground state. And the other option is there is some kind of no-go theorem that prevents me to really, for finite D, get uh, a fully uh, short range state, but if I crank up D, I will go, m I, wi I will approximate better and better, and I get shorter and shorter correlation. And because I mean, there's an argument which I myself I did not fully understand, but, but I think Sharon Dubai and Nick Reed, they have some understanding that these boundary theories, they're actually like living on, on the edge, no? And then I think there is some connection with the fermion doubling problem or no-go theorem, yes. how you, that you yes. cannot really write down some, some local Hamiltonian which is completely chiral at the edge. Yeah. And so I'm wondering whether this is something... But I, I wonder whether this, uh, this thing is not the fact that there might be another mode, you know, if, if, you, if you say, actually, I don't have one chiral mode, but I have two, but the other one with a very steep velocity, then I think I can, I can I'd be all right with this. But, but you would not be able to see it because of it. it's so steep that the first, you know, excitation at, at 2 pi over L will be, uh, you know, beyond the roof. So, so I'm not claiming there is only one mode, but at low energy, f uh, you know, at uh, you, you, d you don't see the other mode. But there could be another, I mean, conceptually, there could be another mode that with a very steep velocity. Coming out of your patch. Yeah, yeah, coming out of the patch. How many are lovely would yeah. I have that? That's pure yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. If I can comment, so first comment sure. is that if it's godless, for this Simon's collaboration, it's more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and the second, you know, it's amazing that it's already a second example of a very simple Hamiltonian for which it seems there is a controversy. It's not clear if it's gapped or if it's gapless. So. Right. Quite, quite amazing. It would seem like if you take a random Hamiltonian, if you do something random and maybe not particularly precise like PEPs, yeah. then it would be much more likely, it seemed like it would be much more likely to fall into something gapped, more gapped than it is in the real life, not less gapped. Yeah, right. Not once you factor in chirality that is being enforced exactly. So chirality seems to be... No, but I, I know another example, which is the J1, J2, the same model, but without the curl term. And, uh, and there is a controversy whether at uh, J2 equal 0.5 of J1, whether you get a symmetry breaking state, whether you get a dimer state, a break translation symmetry, or whether you get also a, a gapless. Uh, ga I, I actually don't understand this comment about about chirality. So we have these plots which show that chiral states there exist chiral states which are gapped. So chiral state at finite bond dimension is gapped. Right? I, I don't know what that means. 
Well, we saw the plots which the are exponential. We saw the plots which are exponential. We saw the plots for correlation functions yeah. at finite void dimension, which yeah. are. Uh, no, 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 uh, no. You mean the uh, and those states <coughs> were Cairo. No, no. We, which plot? You mean my plot or? Yeah, yeah, your plot. Your plot there. This one? No, 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 but, but this, this, is, this doesn't mean exponential. You mean that if you, approx if you approximate the, the, the exact contraction by, by, uh, if you, by, by an environment with a finite bond dimension, uh, then, then it is exponential. But if you just imagine you crank up the, you know, the dimension of the environment here, then what you will see is that this decay is less and less severe. And then eventually this uh, length scale here will just go diverge. <coughs> so, so even for a fun ID, if you would be able to crank up chi to infinity, then probably you will see no exponential, you will see purely algebraic decay. Yes. So it's a finite chi, it's an artifact of the, the fact that you truncate the, the contraction when you do the... It, I, I think the following is even true. Is it correct that the challenge now is to find a chiral peps? With a finite correlation line. Yeah. <coughs> Whether it yeah. counts or does not count from. Well, just just you enforce chirality. Yeah. And now look if generically this seems to have power law decay of correlation. So there seems to be a theorem out there that any chiral peps there might be a theorem that any chiral peps has infinite correlation line. Yeah. But but um, I, I still think there's an idea that here that that, that um, as you crank up the physical bond dimension, indeed it could be that on, on yeah. longer and longer scales the system looks exponential, and there's an algebraic tail in the end, which is <coughs> yeah. due to a no-go theorem. And so you try to to act against the no-go theorem, but as you crank up bond dimension, you do a better job in being gapped or looking exponential over some scale, and then the algebraic tail takes over, which is a bit weird, but, but so that might be what's happening. Yeah. If you mean that you are trying to reproduce an exponential decay by summing power all decays, right? That's so, so yeah. yeah. You're, you're trying to, to simulate uh, challenge <coughs> correlations, but you are using answers that at finite bond dimension will necessarily have power all decay. So at short distances, you manage to superpose many power all decays so that it looks like an exponential, but eventually right, the true right, power all decay right. emerges. I just had a quick question. You mentioned that you would like to realize SU2 level K. Yes, yes. So now we have a model. Can I just take the Nielsen Sierra? Exactly. This is what I. Replace swap spin half? No, 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 no. So it's a more complicated spin one. So it includes, well, maybe I can. Uh, so they have an equivalent paper for spin one where they do the same thing. They just start from the CFT correlator and they deduce. A parameter time, which again for spin one is long range, and they truncate again, and they play the same game, and eventually they came up with a simple uh, Hamiltonian, which has a bilinear interaction, nearest neighbor. So maybe I can write it down if you. Do you have one minute to write it down? It's, it's the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> so are we actually working on, on on this one? So so it's a bit more complicated. So it's a spin one. And it has a J1 term, so it's nearest neighbor. And, and the, 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 the difference now is that there is a biquadratic. So there is a between nearest neighbor side. So it's SI dot SJ square. And then it has again a next nearest neighbor bilinear term. It's J. Would, so this is on the diagonal. And there is a biquadratic term on the diagonal. So the same as I as J square. So this one was not allowed for spin one half. So now it, it comes in. A and there is the the the, 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 the Carroll term. And, uh, and they have a proposition for the values of all these coupling. So I think it's nice to have this proposition because now the parameter space is so large that if you would just do searching in such a large parameter space, that would be, that would be terrible. But, but they, have, they have a proposition for what are the optimal value of these. And they claim basically the, the, the ground state is like the Murid 
uh, non-abelian fractional quantum on state on, on the <coughs> for spin one. So, so the, the the game is to try to to attack this again with with IPEPs. Okay, let's thank you. Okay, thanks a lot.